This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cookie to Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven, and lots of different horticultural friends. And today I'm joined by somebody who I've done two or three podcasts with, Arit Anderson, who I'm sure you will know is a garden designer and is on garden as well, but she'll tell us more about all of that in a minute. And I'm going to ask Henrik, but it's Henrik, um, to pronounce his surname because I can't. No, because <laughs> no it's, it's, uh, it's Scandinavian. Yeah, it is, it is. It's uh, Hermann. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> So, and you spell that because none of you will know how to spell that. Uh, and you'll need to because you'll want to buy what we're going to talk about, which is an incredible book. You spell that S J O with those two dots on top, like little eyes. M A N. That's it. Anyway, the reason that I've, I've asked them to come on today is that Arat started talking to me about this book that came out in the autumn which is called The Essential Tree Selection Guide. And it's published, it's one of those sort of cute Royal Botanic Garden books. And honestly, it's unbelievable body of work. And as I'm sure lots of you who will know if you listen to the podcast, I'm quite a tome deliverer. I'm a bit of a workaholic. And this is the most extraordinary book, which makes any other sort of source book on trees look like a paperback, um, look like a Bills and Mills and Boone, actually, because it's just unbelievably clear, but also honest about the complexity of trees. And we will come on to all of that. But I just felt completely inspired as soon as this tome arrived, that I had to get them to come and chat to all of us about it. So can we start, first of all, hearing about you both separately and then how you met and how this whole incredible project came about. Well, thank you, Sarah, for such a really wonderful intro to the book. And um, I hope as we go through, people will appreciate it as much as your good self. But um, so, yes, I'm a garden designer. I write. Um, As you mentioned, I'm very fortunate to be on Gardeners World presentation and also on the other shows um, as well. But I think that Having come into the industry, which we'll now be getting on for 12 years because we've just crossed into a new year, that I I kind of realised that how am I going to find my place within a, in an industry that has got such a huge amount of subject matter and such a huge amount of um, experience already there? How could I help and add to the party? And I guess that's a bit I've been trying to find with myself. I, I wouldn't ever be able to now call upon 30 plus years of experience because unfortunately I joined the party too late. But what I have found is that I, I'm inquisitive. I'm very passionate about our industry. And I just want people to understand um, as many of the um, components that make up gardens, garden design, plants, um, all of that world. If I can be somebody that can help with the communication of it, that's the bit I'm finding I guess to be a little bit of a thing I love and a a bit of a niche so yeah I I wouldn't say that I have um, one hat that I do all I'm too Virgo and and too inquisitive and I like to do many hats and um, that's a bit about yeah how I how I operate I guess. And also, just just before we hear from Henrik, the the thing you're also really passionate about is sustainability. And that's why, of course, as we will come on to hear about, this is a perfect partnership in that, you know, trees are the thing that if we can plant more, whether in rural or urban or our own domestic spaces, they are unbelievably enriching in all ways. So, and because sustainability is, is I, I feel, so core to your being in horticulture, Arat. It, it mm. makes sense that this is the tome that you've devoted the last section of your life to creating. Oh yes. Well, I think I think again, yes. A lot of that obviously is the 
the time and space that we're in, clearly, with um, the amount of impact that's happening in the world. And, um, and I think that, again, maybe because of coming to this that bit later in my life, it made me realise that when you're trying to learn about a new subject and want to operate in a new you know, a space, it's kind of the question now is, well, how do I know if I'm doing more harm than good? And yeah. that's really been my raison d'etre because genuinely I'm like, but how do I know? And that's what started a lot of that um, inquiry because being literally a novice gardener when I first got my garden and I did textbook. So I got the miracle grow. sorry if I'm saying naming names or, you know, I got all of those bug sprays and I just did what I thought was supposed to happen. And then, of course, you, with, with your own inquiry, you realize, well, actually, what, what, why, why am I doing that? And then, of course, when you inquire a bit more, oh, that actually causes harm. So it might make the garden look good. And that's what's been really important, Sarah, is I think that I've learned more and more over time about it's not about just how things look. It is about the function of, of things. And, and also, obviously, now what's added into the party is and what can be done to help even further. And yeah, so I think that's kind of where that drive of sustainability and environmental consciousness, I guess, comes from is, is that um, I think gardens can be a smoke screen for everything being good. Yeah, as well, you know. Mm. So over to you, Henrik. So you're a plant scientist yep. and a plantsman. So will you tell us all your about your as much as you can you can you can bear about your background and and then how you got involved with Arit and then the book? Yeah, sure. Uh, my background is that I needed money when I was nine years old, so I I, I asked a job at a, as a garden center, as a nursery, and uh, I worked for ten years as uh, in in garden center in a nursery. So I've been trying to selling plants, trying to convince people to why you should buy that one and so on. So then I moved on to garden school, to the university, and then even into research. But I'm still this salesperson in order to try to convince people why you should have that particular tree, that. And, and I, I get frustrated when you see that they're forcing stuff into a situation where you're definitely sure this will never, ever work and so on. So, so, so my background is I'm a, I'm a salesperson still. I, I try to convince uh, the people in a different way. So in my research, I'm a very applied to see. The research question is very applied to try to find, to, to get the, the question from the industry and so on. So that, that's, that's my back, background when it comes to, to why, why I have these kind of glasses when I look at, at plants. And now i not only working at the university, in, yeah, I've been working there for 20 years. Which university? Oh, yeah, Swedish Agriculture University in uh, outside Malmö in southern Sweden. Oh, but I okay. also work as a scientific curator at Gothenburg Botanic Garden. And I also uh, work as an honorary research associate at Kew Garden. So w what I do in all these three places is more or less the same thing, to develop knowledge and guidance of tree and shrubs and plant use for site and functions and climate change and so on. So that, that's, that's the, my focus. So moving on to the book, I mean, it, it is just, I mean, I, we're trying to plant an orchard here at the moment. And it's so true, the thing, because really, I'm very ashamed to tell everybody this, but we actually planted an orchard here when we first came. It was one of the first things we did. And we put in 30 trees and six survived in the end. And it's because we hadn't got this book. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, I, I sort of, maybe we'll come on to that next, which is about right tree, right place. And I love the fact that, you know, in a small garden, you, it's really clear. You just say, okay, you can have Amelanchia, you can have Eliagnus or whatever, or for a big garden, you can go for a massive magnolia or whatever it is. But it's like there is the right appropriate tree. And you can't just go to a garden center, think, there's a tree, let's buy it, it looks nice, plonk it in. It's like we need to know what and how they do and how they grow. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like, it's like when you, this is prov provoked me very much in a way. Because when you buy a car, for example, you take your time to read about the engine. Mm. Can I get Bluetooth? Uh, how many gears? How fast it goes? Uh, how many seats? And so on. You, you actually do your homework. But when you buy plants, like height, autumn colors, flowers, done. Oh, expensive. Okay, we buy that one instead then. 
we, we need to be similar thoroughly when we buy plants as well to ask ourselves, what do I want from these plants? What kind of equipment does the plant need to have in order to grow well there, performing well, but also giving shade or wind barrier or whatever? We, we, th that's the thing I, need, I want to, through this book to change the way we talk about uh, selecting trees in this case. That is exactly what I saw and was really ignited about when I saw Henrik at a talk. We were both at a, a talk for one of the garden design uh, uh, associations and I was hosting it and Henrik was a speaker. And it was just this whole sort of deep dive into these trees that just really, really woke me up. And I felt like I was in the tree or I was a leaf one minute and then I was down at the root system and, you know, really felt like this whole think like a tree sort of vibe mm. was quite exciting. And to your point, Sarah, earlier was was really quite new and refreshing and I hadn't seen that elsewhere. And that really made me think, wow, what what have I done so far today? I've done hype, spread and season of interest, which is not a criticism because that's the only language that I had. Yeah. Mm. And so how do you, I, I want to come on to the whole ecosystem thing in much greater detail in a minute, but how do you imagine people using the book? So, you know, say I'm choosing my apple tree or trees, you know, maybe I want 15, it was my 60th birthday from my husband and but um, we've got it on hold at the moment because the book arrived, so I want to get it right. But how do you advise using it to really get the best out of your selections? So one of the things, as is, is Henrik was saying, it is about, first of all, starting to ask yourself some questions around what you need, which sometimes when we are in a, a nursery or at a garden centre, we're much more emotionally driven by what we see at times. If we haven't done that level of planning and question asking, we'll just go with what we see. So one of the things that, you know, when we're chatting, Henrik will always say, first of all, what do you want? So for you, Sarah, in this instance, what do I want? Well, I want an orchard. I want to have lots of fruit production. I want that, that to be producing for as many as long as it can throughout the whole season, etc. Yeah, what the first thing is like, what, what do I really need? You might again start to ask, well, I also want to be able to go and sit down there. So I need to know that I've got levels of shade and I want to make sure there's a, there's provision for me, but also for wildlife um, that will be around there. So I think it's just pushing ourselves to ask a bit more around what 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 do we need and that sounds very human centric and very kind of anthropogenic etc but at the same time if we're not understanding our need then it'll be very difficult to go out and choose the right tree so that's kind of the first thing and Henrik you jump in and tell me off if I'm wrong at any section no go for it but then after that it's a case of right well so now I need to understand about trees and I've got my list of, of requirements and the ecosystem services of what a tree um, can provide. So for those um, listeners who don't know what ecosystem services are, that's what the natural world can give into the environment for free. These are services that a tree, a plant, uh, an ocean, you know, any of the ecosystems provide into our um, world. And we as humans, we get we get lucky because we can obviously play around with those. We can create um, ecosystems, but really, it's about the services that, that are provided for us. And the, what the first section of the book is about is to enable people to understand the services of what these trees can offer, because that will invoke some of the questions that you may not have thought about. So, one of the ones uh, is cultural ecosystem services. Yeah, for example. So that's very much about. Well, what do what's the what place making do I want to make with this tree? I might there's one thing just to like you say plonk a load of trees in, but if we go back to thinking about the tree that was cut down, yes, the, the, yeah, uh, the um, help me out here, my brain. The, 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 the sycamore. sycamore, the sycamore. Thank yeah. you, the sycamore. Yeah. Cap. So that's a classic example that culturally yeah. that tree had so much affinity for people. And when it cut down, I mean, I've not, I've not seen that tree and now I won't. There was a real emotional pull to it. So there's almost like the, the, the how, what, because if I'm coming to your orchard, Sarah, because I can imagine the how it will be, I will come there not only just to look at the detail of those trees, but I know that the choices that you make, the layout that you make, will all of a sudden will be very placemaking for future generations. That's just one aspect of it. Um, 
Henrik, obviously, if you want to talk, talk about the other ecosystem services as well. No, go for it. Well, we've also got provisioning is another one. What do the what what do trees provide in terms of? So they're providing timber for us. They're providing you know, fruit and edibles for us. They're providing shade for us. All of these things, and then and this and the book goes into the detail of the provisional ecosystem services, the cultural ecosystem services, the supporting ecosystem services and the fourth one Henrik is regulating is regulating regulating yeah Henrik will you pick up these these second two so the supporting or perhaps the first of, of all the most important are the supporting ecosystem services and then the, and then the fourth one yeah sure but uh, the supporting is very much up uh, how the trees and vegetation creates environment so we can live on this planet everything to produce um, oxygen to breathe but also how they create habitats for other plants and animals to live and thrive everything from habitat to nest to uh, food for pollen and so on so so that's that's the most important because if we fail there we we are failing as a society and everything and the, the, the regulating ecosystems, uh, so ecosystem services are more the engineer-ish type of um, ecosystem service. They can help us to mitigate heat, cold wind. They can filtering air and thereby take up uh, pollution particles. They can help us to reduce effects of floodings and so on. So, that, so they, these are most technical. So, when you take a step back and look at the history of ecosystem services, when we start to argue, like Law Olmsted, when he designing the, the Central Park, they talk about a lot about the, the regulating ecosystem service by fresh air and so on. So that, that's, the, that's the easiest way, was in the beginning anyway, in order to argue why trees are important than the supporting, provisioning and cultural ecosystem services came afterwards a little bit because they are more difficult to quantify and put a value on it, so to say. And it, 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 when I was reading it, it, it sort of struck me. I spend a lot of time in Greece and I absolutely love Greece. And there the white mulberry has this uh, tradition of, you know, as, as we know, it, it's used for the silkworm. And so it was there. But then in villages, you find all the village squares have it because it gives a sense of community because it has such big leaves that it gives shade. So community provisioning, regulating and supporting ecosystems. So it, it's, it does all of it, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is why you see in every village in Greece. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's, the, this, that's the future because both in a small private garden but also in a public greenery, space is a thing we don't have a lot of. So we need to think about multifunctional plantations. So as you said, it's nothing new. We had done it 200 years or even further away in history, but now we have a language to talk about it. But that, that's a, a key thing. You, you just talk about this multifunctional plantation, that, that tree. If we just have space for two trees in my garden, what they should do, and then you list it. And then suddenly you have a big list of things you want from this tree. And then it's very important to you select the right tree and also place it in the garden on the right specific place. And then hopefully you can tick all the boxes there. And I remember, I think, reading it in the introduction, actually, it's just the thing of don't think of a tree as over there in a way. L look up and out, you know, look up. So stand underneath it and look up and look out sort of through it and it's like they're not a static, they're not like a building. And I love that. I love that sort of idea that they they just obviously so key to our future, but also they give a life enhancement on, on so many, so many, so many different levels. Well, Henrik has a lovely way well, say, so, because you always have that lovely way of describing it, Henrik, which is the fact that, you know, the buildings, if you kind of like have an analogy, you know, buildings and architecture are the photographs, it's the photography, it's the still, but the landscape... The landscape is the movie, the dynamic yeah. moving part. And and I think that's the bit that sometimes can become overwhelming, certainly as I have been coming into the industry and learning things. Oh, my God, how am I going to learn this sort of dynamic uh, movie that's going on? But that's what makes it really exciting. And once you start to get into the movie part, then you can start playing around and see this animation that's going on in front of you. And I think also with the trees, especially when we're thinking about trees in the garden, and I, and I know, you know I've been lucky enough to come down to your, your home, 
I know as well that when you select the trees for your orchard, one of the things that's also that, that we talk about is to look and see what other trees are in your vicinity. Where are the gaps? Because also, because obviously your trees are going to introduce quite a lot of uh, spring nectar because of the blossoms, but then is there a collapse at the end of the season where there's no fruit or no blossom? So that 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 kind of, it starts connecting you then into that wider environment of how your trees within your own personal space are becoming part of the, the bigger canopy that sits in the urban or the rural environment. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely. Well, I mean, it is just a truly magnificent book. Anyone interested in the outside world um, will just hugely be rewarded by it. And I wondered if we could end with each of us. I mean, we could talk for hours about this, but <laughs> if each of us just takes a couple of minutes to describe the importance of a tree or a wood or a collection of trees or whatever, and just describe that and, and why it means so much to each of us. Well, I'll start with a tree that was in my life when I was very little. So I lived in Hertfordshire, Greenbelt, you know, small, medium-sized sort of town. And where we lived, um, we lived on a little cul-de-sac where there was a, a green space, literally sort of some lawn uh, in the front, which us kids could play out. And there was an oak tree that was kind of diagonally opposite to our house. Now, that tree was so significant because that was the tree that I was not allowed to go beyond because my mum then couldn't see because it disappeared me off into the next part of the neighbourhood. It's the tree that we all met at as kids, meet you by the oak tree. It's the tree that we do run outs from. We play Tim Tom Tammy, which is a 70s version of hide and seek, as it were. We would take shade under that tree. It was just it was there. It was just. It was just always there. There, there was also uh, not too far from us as well, like a little spinny, as opposed to like a full wood. That we again, that I was allowed to. If my mum knew where I, that, that's where I was going to be off of these other fields, I was allowed to go there, and I would dog walk with her there as well. And um, the thing is, quite. I know this is going to sound really funny, but it is. It's also a tree connection. That's going for a walk at the, in, in that spinny of woods with my mum with the dog. Now. I was fostered and so I'm to a white family. So my mum has uh, European hair and I've got very tight, curly Afro hair. And I used to love listening to the wind go through the trees and seeing my mum's hair move because she used to love the wind in her hair. And this whole thing about the movement of the trees, going on special dog walks. Sometimes she'd let me go out with her in the evening and we'd go for a, like a late evening night walk. And that would all be kind of quite tree focused. So this whole connection to trees, which I think people don't, probably stop and think about that even if you're like now oh I don't want a tree in my house in my garden because I'm worried about the root system etc go back to when you were younger or go back to traveling I used to go travel to into London from Hertfordshire along the M1 and again at that point I was very into my fashion days but because that drive was my decompression from coming in and out of the city I used to absolutely watch the trees seasonally and I was not consciously doing it but now I go back and I would love it I'd just see that tree change so yeah those moments were as right when we were writing the book and I thought oh my god I don't know the name of all these trees that Henrik knows and how am I gonna ever learn them but if you go into the emotion of your connection to trees then the rest of it comes I think yeah uh yeah when we talk about trees that have been important for you I will all often come back to some uh, I think three or four big big old uh, apple trees because where I grew up in a housing area there was old gardens which have been yeah the house was gone but the old fruit trees are still there and these four uh, apple trees were the center of our kids where we meet up after school yeah see you soon and everybody knew that that was the tree so we were climbing the tree we have secret clubs in the trees and in the, in the autumn, we was just eating apples until we fell sick. And, but that, they were a very important connection spot, the trees, both up in the tree canopies. And I, as a researcher, I, sometimes I ask for um, some school groups, kindergarten coming over to Botanic Garden or to the University of Arboretum. And I often take the, the, the group of children, I forced, not force them, but I, I ask them to, to go in different kind of uh, plantations. And 
it makes me really glad when I see that um, after five minutes, two thirds of the kids is in the tree canopy because climbing trees to feel the joy by up being the tree crown, it's, um, it's amazing. It was amazing for me. And I see that it still is important for the modern kids of today. So climbing trees are important and fruit trees which are strong in the woods, also have like an architecture that can have four, five kids at once in the tree. That's, um, that's the perfect tree for me. Wonderful. I mean, I, to be honest, my tree was going to be an oak, but because Aretz was an oak, I'm going to choose a beech, which was three, in fact, trees in my parents' garden when I was very small. And with beeches, they tend to have, just like you said, Henry, they tend to have this thing of being climbable. They tend to have quite boughs quite low to the ground. So even when you're quite small, I'm a twin, uh, we were able to kind of push each other up to the first bough and then we could scramble off up into the tree and hide from our parents or our siblings. We were the youngest and number four and five. And then as I got a bit older, I, my, my parents were both gardeners and my father was a plant collector and he had the most amazing Sikkiman collection, which of course under beach thrived. And in that sort of dry shade, they they really thrived. And mainly it was cyclum and coom, which flowers in spring and has leaves in autumn, but it was also cyclum hedrofolium, which has flowers in autumn and leaves in spring. But there were a few others that he collected in Crete and things. Anyway, it's um, I still go back because my mother still lives there. And I, lo- I, lo- I always go pretty much first to that tree because at any time of year, the combination of the spring leaves or the coppery leaves and then the the um, cyclamen carpet underneath, which now extends the size of this room. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. And they've done nothing to it. But so I suppose with me, it's trees and plants together. But yeah, I just have great affection for that particular tree. Well, I love it because I love the th- I love listening to this again. The storytelling isn't that what is so wonderful yeah. about the the, the, the the tree? I mean, obviously, in lots of landscapes and things, but I think, of course, because there's history with trees, and I find that when I was listening to both of you, you're there. I'm there with you. Yes, I'm yes, absolutely yes. there. And I think that that's so wonderful about trees is the fact that knowing that they've been planted you know, beforehand, often the the big trees that we see, especially if we're in the Kew Gardens of the world, et cetera, or any big arboretum. And um, and just having that privilege, really, that we we get to see the tree that that the other person planted all those years ago. And I think that's that's just quite an amazing thing. So I think on on a very basic level in terms of being able to plant trees, yes, it's great for future generations. But at the moment, there is an environmental need. I think one thing I would just like to add, Sarah, is the fact that one of the big questions that I get asked, and Henrik, I'm not sure whether you do as well, but will planting trees save the planet? There's a big push at the moment for the, these numbers that people hear, the trillion tree planting. And in the UK, we've got to get all these millions of trees. And one of the things that is um, really important is that the numbers are important. But what's more important than the numbers is that they actually need to get to, to maturity so planting three trillion trees um means nothing if none of them actually survive planting 10 100 or 150 trees that get through to maturity are obviously going to do so much better so i think when people mm-hmm. are thinking about their tree selection as henrik started to talk about with regards to doing your research p- the other part of the the, the tree uh, uh, scenario is making sure that you've got the resource and the capacity to actually look after them, that you are able to do that. Speaking to nurserymen, speaking to specialists, if, if, if needs be, to help you to get them into maturity and to look after the, the trees that you've got currently. So if you have got quite a few trees in your space or you know of trees nearby, making sure that you're looking out for dead and disease within them, replacing them. Henrik was in my garden um, about, I don't know, about a month or so ago. And I inherited a massive, great big eucalyptus that was in my tiny 10 metre by 4 metre garden. It's a little bit out of scale. Um, And it's kind of very, well, way too close to the studio. So again, Henrik was chatting to me going, well, what are you going to do about succession? Because at some point, that eucalyptus is not going to be able to stay or your studio has got to go one or the other. And I'm very conscious that the eucalyptus that I inherited, going back to that list of 
functions it's not multifunctional as there are more trees that can there are other, so many other trees that could be much more multifunctional than the eucalyptus so that's something that i've got to look at to start thinking about planting something instead of when that time comes or i've got eucalyptus has to hand over the baton to the next tree so yeah so that's also important the succession part so anyway i just wanted to add that little bit and i also think it's Really important to end with just uh, when we were chatting a little bit before, this is a come out of lockdown project. And I know we're all sort of slightly tired of hearing that perhaps, but but honestly, the, the detail and the knowledge and the photographs and just the depth of experience that comes out in this book, I honestly just don't think anyone should plant a tree without at least going to the library to get this out but or asking for it on your uh, present list for next year or whatever, next Christmas. But it, it is just extraordinary. And it's a life's work that was done in that uh, year of when we were all um, stuck at home or those those months that we were stuck at home. And um, I can really see that now. It's it's To, to have achieved this is, is absolutely extraordinary. So thank you both so very much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And we must also thank um, lovely Anna Mumford from Filbert Press, who who stuck by us in that very difficult time and believed in the book as well, because um, that was so important to, to have her behind us. So, and, and yeah, thank you so much for having us on. Thanks for listening to Grow Cookie to Range with me and Arit and Henrik. I found that incredibly interesting chatting to them and really makes me think differently about gardening in general, but particularly, of course, about trees. Next week, Arthur is joining me again, Arthur Parkinson, and we're going to go through what we feel are our real highlights of our spring and summer range. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.